Hey there, Kevin Rose here from Dig.com. We are at the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley, California. Today I'm very excited for our eighth Dig Dialogue, this time with Google's Marissa Meyer. We're going to be asking your top questions as voted on by the 39 million member Dig community. Let's go inside. Hey there, Kevin Rose here, founder of Dig.com, and it is my honor today to be with Marissa Meyer, who is VP of Search and User Experience at Google. Marissa, thanks for being on the show. No problem. I'm excited to be here. We've got just a ton of questions. So we have the entire <laughs> Dig community uh, go out and submit questions, and then dig them up and bear the ones they didn't like. Had over a thousand questions submitted, so lots <laughs> of people want to ask questions. And uh, I'm going to read off the top ten as voted on by the community. Okay, great. All right, starting with number one, uh, with 441 people digging this up, submitted by Abby Gargoyle, do you ever get disturbed at what you see as most search topics? Uh, I really don't. I think that when you see, I mean, our searches are interesting because they really are on the pulse of what people are thinking about. And it's really interesting to see what captures people's imaginations. Is it something from pop culture? Is it something in the news? And so, you know, watching those queries rise and fall is really interesting because you get to see, you know, different trends as they sweep across different countries. And I think it, it's really intriguing to see what people search for and get to see a little glimpse into what we call the zeitgeist, right? The, sort of the spirit of the moment in terms mm -hmm. of what people are thinking and interested in. So I've been in the main lobby where you see all the different searches scrolling by. How do you see like what the most common terms are? Do you get like reports for that, or like how would you? Yeah, we so we analyze the search traffic in aggregate, but you can look at there and see sort of you know what were the top queries for each day, and also what the, actually even more interesting than that are what are the rising queries. Gotcha. On any given day, right. and so we actually now have a site on. Uh, Google.com slash trends, right, yeah. where you can also see the hot trends. And so we show you the 100 fastest rising searches that we were seeing that day. Uh, moving on to question number two, uh, with 418 digs uh, submitted by Nefser7, with products like Google Docs, Voice, Wave, as well as Chrome OS, Google seems to be strongly encouraging the move to the cloud. However, a lot of users do not have fast internet access, and they are relatively low bandwidth caps. Do you consider internet service providers as a major bottleneck in the user experience of a cloud-oriented system? If so, what do you think can be done to fix or circumvent the potential problem? Well, we do think that the web overall needs to be faster, right? When you look at how rich some of the applications that we can build today are with JavaScript, Google Docs, Gmail, Google Maps are all good examples. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of cases, people are really constrained in terms of the bandwidth or the speed of their connection. And we think that that's something that will change over time, but certainly there's reasons to accelerate it. That's one reason why we've experimented with things like Google Web Accelerator and Google Gears to try and really speed up performance for people who are on low bandwidth connections. That's also why we have HTML versions of these products. But on the whole, we're also interested in just making the web better to use overall. Because when people, when the web gets better, people use it more. When people use the web more, they search more. That's good for us. That's we think good for the users. And so we are really interested in making the web better. That's one reason why we we engaged on the white spaces debate last year too. Was just because we really wanted to see could we use some of this spectrum to actually increase people's bandwidth and really open up new products and offerings that would help make the web faster. Gotcha. Now you've uh, launched a handful of standalone applications as well as some web ones as well. Uh, do you see future Google apps all kind of being in the cloud, or? Well, I think on the whole, the cloud just makes sense, right? There's the data that's on your computer, and it's there once. And if your computer gets lost or stolen or damaged, you just lose that data forever, right? right? Where there's a lot of companies that are going to the trouble of setting up large data centers with your, where your data is replicated and it's reliable and is available anywhere with a username and a password. And you know, for a lot of the pictures you care about and the files you care about, if you want to be able to access them, be a little more portable, and have that reliability of making sure that data isn't lost, we think that the cloud is a really good option for most consumers. It's a lot more reliable than your computer. Yes. I, I thought I was going to get away from Gmail on flights, but it turns out now they have internet access on there, so I'm always on email now. <laughs> I love the internet planes. <laughs> <laughs> it's killing me. I can actually get work done, and then the email comes again. 
<laughs> all right, so question number three, um, what are you going to do with all the data you're collecting from users? 362 people dug this story submitted by Inceptius. So collecting a lot of data. Well, I think that you know it varies from product to product, but there's a couple of overarching philosophies that guide what we do across all of our products. One, we think it's really important to be transparent with our users, to show them what data we have and how it's being used. So be it something like web history, where based on your searches and your toolbar activity, we have a log of your activity. You, you can go and you can see that whole log, and you can actually decide to opt out of the feature altogether. You can go in and say, you know, I, I wish that I could just delete this part of my session. Right. Right? And, and, and so we really we think you know, that's important. Um, and so we've also been looking at this now on our advertising side as we have started to look at different display advertising. We have behavioral targeting. Right. Um, and in those cases, we allow people to go in. They can see the interests that we've associated with them and actually edit that profile. Uh, so again, we want there to be transparency. We want there to be choice. Do you participate or not? And control. Can you actually move, change, delete the data? Because we ultimately believe the data really belongs to our users. Mm -hmm. We're the safekeeper of that data, but the data belongs to them, and they should be able to decide how it gets used and even what data we have. Right. Do you see this data eventually powering other applications that you have? Like if you're going to go to you know, Google Maps and look for restaurants, and it knows that you've you know, been clicking on certain things in the past, would it ever power recommendations in any sense, or is it just mainly for ads at this point? Um, well, I think that there's a, one, we definitely have seen instances where understanding what you've done in the past helps us improve search. Mm -hmm. So our search results can get better. We know what kinds of results you've already clicked on, so we can actually introduce more variety into your search results and things that you already know about. We know perhaps maybe your location. Those types of things can really help us improve the quality of search. And so right. there's certainly some synergies across products, but we try and be very clear in our privacy policy how the data is being used, where it's being used, and, and you know, all the details a user would want to know in order to make an informed trade-off about using the product. All right, moving on to the next question. Um, what happened to the 10 to the 100th promise Google made uh, on its last birthday to put $10 million into the best ide ideas submitted to Google with final selections made by a panel selected by Google? The initial decision makers would have to come in December, but then it was delayed due to a huge response. Um, and now it appears it's gone by the wayside. Um, this was 280 votes submitted by Clay T2. Uh, yeah, what's going on with that? So we haven't. It hasn't gone by the wayside. Um, we were really excited on our 10th anniversary to roll out Project 10 to the 100, which of course is a, a play on Google's name. Mm -hmm. um, and what we had was we one had a huge response, and two. To actually make a lot of these ideas come to life, there is there are big execution hurdles, and we've been looking through, working through those, looking at them, trying to understand, you know, well, if we put these ideas out there for a public vote, we want to be able to make sure that they can actually happen. Right. So we have to look at feasibility and really judge those things up front. And so we'll be making some announcements coming up this fall mm -hmm. to close the process, get the public vote going, and and ultimately uh, decide on the winning idea or ideas. Uh, but it's been really interesting to see how the process has taken shape because the response has been great. There were a ton of good ideas. Yeah. And now we really want to be able to take the funding, that $10 million, and really make a big impact in the world using those ideas that came from our users. So uh, too many people submitting their ideas and, and too long to figure it all out, but it's, it's coming. Yeah, so we wish it had happened faster, but that said, we want to make sure that it happens, yeah. that, it, that, that it happens well and really makes a big impact makes in the way sense. that the person who submitted the idea meant to. Yep. All right, next question. How do you feel about Bing? I believe the search engine has some very positive features. Uh, does Google plan on implementing any significant changes in response to Bing's release? 279 people dug that uh, story submitted by Rojo2. Uh, well, we really welcome competition in search. I think that you know, one of the things that happens is when you have strong competitors, and Microsoft, uh, of course, behind Bing is a very, very strong competitor that needs to be taken seriously. When you have strong competitors, it makes everyone work harder, and that makes search better, and that's ultimately really better for users. So you know, we're really aware of what Bing is doing, and, and looking at that, 
That said, we've always done well focusing on our users, and that's really where our focus has stayed. Uh, analyzing what are their problems, what are their needs, how can we roll out features that serve those users best, and that's what we're staying focused on. Uh, it's important not to get too distracted by yeah. the competition, especially when you're building new features and new things. Is, is it kind of exciting? Like, what was it like on day one when Bing came out? Did you like, yeah, okay, I gotta go play at this for a half hour to see what they're, what they're working on, or? Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly did some searches yeah. um, when when this, the site first came online, um, but you know, I th as again, like I think it's important not to over focus on it. Interestingly, a lot of the features there's a lot of feature overlap. Uh, you know, their refinements might be in different places sure. here or there, but a lot of the the technologies are the same. And for us, we're really looking at it not part and parcel in terms of the different features, but what is the overall experience? like you know how who has the most relevant results how do we mm -hmm. get greater comprehensiveness how satisfying is that user experience and also speed right one of the things we're really focused on is making sure that Google is fast that the site is fast that we get you to the result you wanted to go to quickly and so those are the things we're staying focused on because that's where our, our users really want us to advance all right, uh, next question with 239 digs submitted by Bama Fun. What product that Google has in beta are you most excited about at the moment? Uh, well, we have a lot of uh, different yeah, well, products. That <laughs> explain to me that also. <laughs> have, <laughs> explain to me the beta process. Like Gmail is um, in beta for quite some time. Gmail is in beta for some, quite some time. I mean, I think it was interesting because you know there's a very rigorous definition around beta for installable software, right? Mm -hmm. That's to basically say, you know, this is something new. It wouldn't say get shipped to an OEM, right? right. Like it could harm your computer. We might right. not have all the bugs out of it. What beta means in a web service has sort of been evolving. And I think even on Google products, it's sort of been evolving. Uh, you know, but generally when we're, we're happy with the state of the product and we feel it is really reliable, fully baked in terms of features, we take the beta label off. I think for Gmail that was true probably a while ago, but I'm glad we finally made it official. So in terms of the betas that I like the best, it's not really a formal beta, it's more in preview mode at the moment, but I'm really excited about Google Wave. I just played with that for the first time today. Yeah. I, I finally got my invite. I'm, it was awesome. I, I really like the interface. It's cool. I mean, we're really focused at Google on technological insight that leads to innovation. And I think that you know, if you look at things like you know, Gmail, we realized we could use our computing infrastructure to provide massive amounts of storage and really raise the bar in terms right. of how much online storage there was. And Google Book Search, we were like, well, we can take photography and OCR and scan the world's books. And so we like to sort of look at, well, what is the technological trend and try and build innovation on top of that? And Wave, I just think the core insights of what happens in email or communication system if you're server side. Right? And what happens if you treat all data in a really uniform way via mm -hmm. XML? So conversations, photo albums, they, you know, blogs, they can all seamlessly be dragged and dropped into each other. I think the, the elegance of the innovation that has come out of those, those key insights in the product is really spectacular. So I'm very, I'm very excited about what that could become. Do you see Wave as being a kind of standalone product on its own, or, or do you see some of that kind of being a, uh, a proving ground for some stuff that might eventually roll into like something like a Gmail? I think, I think it's both. I think there certainly will. I mean, because of the server-side nature of it, there, there will be Wave accounts and people signing in to Wave. That said, there's certainly some ideas that we think could transcend Wave and, mm -hmm. and you know, make the leap over to Gmail and chat. And we really just want to see how do our users respond to these different systems and these features, what's useful for them. Cool. All right. Uh, next question with 223 digs, uh, submitted by Sean B. What do you think of Wolfram Alpha? Again, I think my answer here is similar to the question about the Microsoft competition. I think the spring was a really exciting time in search, and even the, the, you know, yes. the summer continues too. There's lots of people inventing new things, trying new things, and it makes you really you know, reconsider what search is. We had a couple of big launches ourselves in May with Google Squared and our tool belt, and really thinking about, well, what happens if you re-examine the whole paradigm of search? What if it's not? keywords coming in and 10 results? What if you imagine doing data extraction and building comparison tables? Or you know, what if you imagine building a lot of semantic intelligence into the search engine? And it really does change how the paradigm works. Mm -hmm. And I think it really shows me just how early we are in search. 
Yeah. Right? Like search is like a science and it's like biology or physics in the 1500s. And yes, it's exciting today and there's big breakthroughs every day, but you know, it'll be hundreds of years before we have the microscope, right? And you know, I mean, obviously the internet time is compressed and there'll be big advances all along. Mm -hmm. But you know, some of these technologies, when you look at sort of how they really re-examine even though it's now a common paradigm today of internet yeah. search, I think it shows really what this technology could evolve into. Do you think, does that push uh, you and your engineering teams even harder when you see stuff like this? Like friendly competition, new ideas, is it, it seems like a, a new kind of resurgence of, of, of new search engines recently. Well, I definitely think that's true. I do think that the rising tide floats all boats because I also think that just having more people aware of search what could be possible, how it's evolving, really helps, right? And causes people to search more and think more critically about it. And yes, it definitely causes us to work harder, but I also think that it really challenges our ideas, mm -hmm. right? And you know, what does the search engine of 2025 look like? Right. Right, like that's a pretty hard thing to imagine. Do you talk to it? Do you still type keywords in? Can you type concepts? Can you do all of the above? Mm -hmm. What kinds of answers come back? Are they like encyclopedias? Are they comparison tables? Are they maps? Are they a fusion of all those different things? What happens with mobile phones? What happens in terms of personalization? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of really interesting questions about where the future of search is going. Cool. All right, uh, next question submitted by, 191 digs submitted by Dingo MD. What do you think is Google's biggest threat? I think threats are always opportunities as well. And I think the opportunity for us is to focus on the users and innovate. And of course, then the opposite of that is really the biggest threat is that we would become somehow complacent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you know, there's a lot in Google culture that is structured to really empower small teams, get things done, use 20% time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's worked really well for us as an engine for innovation. And the culture is also really focused on end users. How do we solve really big problems that matter to all of our users every day, mm -hmm. if it went, you know, where, wherever possible? And I think that you know, that's, we've got to, one, continue to focus on that. And, you know, the flip side of that is also really the biggest threat to us. Yeah, I, was, I mean, when you think about what Google has been and going out and using PageRank and crawling pages, do, I mean, people have talked about Twitter potentially being a kind of real-time search and more of a threat. Is that something you would see as kind of like, you know, a threat at all, or? I think it's, I think in many ways it could be very complementary. Our mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And for us, we really do want the world's information. This is one reason why we've brought satellite images online with Google Maps. We're bringing the books online with Google Books, mm -hmm. right? You know, we've tried to empower video coming online through things like YouTube and, and Google Video. We've worked really hard to bring a lot of data that wasn't online before online now. And I think that that's really the goal, uh, to make all that searchable and accessible. And when you look at things like Twitter or other real-time update engines, right. they are really useful. You know, Is that party any good? Is that conference any good? Is there snow on that ski slope or not? Right. <laughs> Those types of things, you know, that type of real-time update can answer very well. Right, which is something and like you're not going to go out and be able to find by people doing, I mean, you might do a blog post about what the weather conditions are, but it's more that's, it didn't seem like there'd be that much data about it, whereas with the real-time stuff and the phones and tweeting. Yeah, and so I think it's really about, about how real-time data could complement search, right? Because Twitter is both a communication system among friends and it's, the, it's got all the social elements. Right. That said, there really are some interesting real-time trends there that right. we've seen. Um, you know, so even just in the past few months, you know, Air France 447, Michael Jackson, interestingly, even Google Wave, yeah. right? It turns out it's much faster to pound out a tweet than it is to do a blog or right. a news right. story. Right. So things show up there first. And so we definitely think that including that in the world's information, hopefully being able to search that and surface that for our users mm -hmm. um, with all these different real-time updates coming in is something that could complement our search engine for those types of queries. Mm -hmm. But that said, a lot of times people also want the rich backstory that's available on the web beyond those updates. Right, absolutely. All right, uh, next question with 190 digs submitted by B. Zacks. Could you please take us through a day in the life of the boss? Have you seen this uh, Saturday Night Live uh, skit at all? Uh -uh, no, I haven't. Uh, it's awesome. <laughs> All right, so um, basically, walk us through your day. What's an average day for you? Um, uh, I usually wake up sometime between 7 and 8, and I kind of put around home. I'll do work from there. I'm in the office by 9, 
uh, and I usually have meetings from 9 to 6, and I'll have ad hoc meetings with teams to go over the UI, to go over product plans, you know, to go over you know, any, any types of issues that are coming up, you know, approving different launches, you know, readying those types of things from about 9 to 4. And then from 4 to 6, I sort of have free form time where I will touch base with people, sometimes for 5 minutes, sometimes for 15 minutes, but it's basically people who've had stuff come up over the course of the day mm -hmm. to make sure that we can keep moving fast. That if mm -hmm. they're like, hey, I've hit this hurdle and I really need to talk it through with you or get this approved, like I have that time at the end of the day to get to that. And then usually I'll have a few more meetings from, say, like six to seven and then I'll transition from that to going and having dinner at the Google cafeteria and then coming back doing email getting some work work done and then depending if I'm really ambitious and do I you get sleep it. in your office <laughs> or what's the deal here um, I do I usually I mean it depends like if I work late at night I'll usually go home you know sometime between like 11 and midnight some nights I'll get out earlier and like go out with friends and things but uh, and like in terms of exercise because I say like usually my d evening ends with exercise so I like to I think that I exercise in the morning when I first wake up, but the truth is I'm much more of a night owl, so it's more frequent for me to, to hit snooze a few times, yeah. like, you know, get into the office by nine and then wrap up the day, you know, on, on the treadmill, so. Cool. Uh, last question of the day. With 182 digs, uh, so by SJB Dallas wants to know, is Google Skynet? Uh, well, we, we certainly are rooting for John Connor and, yeah. like, <laughs> and all of that, but in truth, in truth, no, right? We're, we're a search engine, we're a company, we really care about innovation and great things happening in the planet. We certainly think that computers can become a lot smarter and we really are, are pushing for that outcome, but I think there's, there's a pretty big difference. Do you think there's, a, aside from Google, I mean, just in the web in general, do you think there's a, is it worrisome that so many people are collecting so much data about you and what you're doing uh, throughout the web or? I think that it's important to be really informed of that as a consumer and understand what information is out there. I think the trend that concerns me most now on the internet is the concept of anonymity, right? And I think that it's, you know, I really feel that the virtual world follows the physical world. Physical world's been around a lot longer, it's gotten more of the kinks out, the virtual mm -hmm. world's very young. And I think when you look at some of the systems, the closer it sort of parodies and follows that, the, the, the memes that you see in, in the physical world, the better off you are. And there's very few things you can do anonymously right. in the physical world. And I think that over time on the internet, there will be less anonymity. And I actually think that's good. I think it creates you know, more accountability, yeah. people acting more responsibly. And you know, I really, I think that overall, we all want the web to be great. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's something that we really need to work on. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was actually, a while back, I was talking to some, uh, some folks who were at Facebook just about this. And uh, they actually noticed when they were tying real physical IDs to, to comments and things like that, that the conversation just elevates so much more than just an anonymous post somewhere with people leaving random you know, comments and flame wars and things like that. So. Like, absolutely, right? If somebody, if, if one of your friends can come and say, hey, that was you. Right, then right? you're like, oh, and, I probably shouldn't have said that. And as I said, like, you know, in the physical world, there's very, if you think about it, like, what could you do throughout the course of the day that no one else would know about? Yeah. And there's very few things. Not right? a whole lot. You could, you could riot and put masks on and things like that, but those are all the bad things, so I guess right. that's like good examples. <laughs> All right. Well, Marissa, thanks so much for being on Dig Dialogue. We really appreciate thanks. it. On behalf of the Dig community and everyone else there, uh, thanks so much. It was really fun. Thank you for having me.